Good morning. My name is Renda Slim. I'm a senior fellow and director of the program on conflict resolution and track to dialogue at the Middle East Institute. It's my pleasure to moderate this panel, which is aimed at exploring Iraq's crisis of governance after and since the Basra protests. Uh, Middle East Institute is co-organizing this event with the Institute of Regional and International Studies at the American University of Iraq, Soleimani. The topic of governance is extremely important in the context of ongoing discussions about how Iraq can finally move towards sustainable peace, ensuring effective governance at the national level and empowering local governance are key to stabilization in Iraq and addressing the increasing gap between elected officials and their constituents. Much of the debate about effective governance has pivoted around government ability to better deliver basic services, most importantly electricity and water, rooting out corruption, improving security, diversification of the economy, and creating jobs, especially for Iraq's youth. Protests of over electricity shortage have already started uh, in Karbala, and it's only early June, and who knows what's going to happen, especially, again, in, in, Bas in, in Basra. When argument Max Kelton and his co-author Zimkan Ali Salim make in their report titled Basra's Political Marketplace, Understanding Government Failure After the Protest, is the need to assess and understand the impact of local political dynamics on the challenge of service provision and reconstruction. They argue that, quote, the failure of reconstruction is a product of this fraught, extractive political marketplace, end of quote. We have assembled today a terrific panel to help us unpack issues around governance and its challenges in Iraq. Uh, I will do brief introductions, uh, detailed, uh, more bio details are available in the event package and online. To my immediate left is Dr. Aqil Abbas. He's a professor at the American University of Iraq, Suleimani. To my immediate right is Max Kelton. He's the director of the Institute of Regional and International Studies at the American University of Iraq, Suleimani. Next to Mac is Basma Alouche, and she's an advocacy and communication officer at the Norwegian Refugee Council USA. And soon to join us is Bilal Wahab, who is the Nathan and Esther Wagner Fellow at the Washington Institute for Near East Policy. In order to promote interaction among the panelists and with the audience, the format today is designed to be a moderated discussion, Davos style format. In the first 45 minutes of the panel, we will do two rounds of questions, which will, I will ask to panelists relevant to the issues at hand. And in our preparation for this panel, the five of us agreed that each answer should not exceed five minutes. Uh, in the last 30 minutes, we will open the floor for questions and answers with the audience. So I'm going to be starting with a question to Mac here. Uh, in your policy brief on Basra's political marketplace and the lead up to the 2018 protest, you argued, again, quote, the durability of the political marketplace has and will continue to inhibit the harmonious coordination of multiple processes at once, end of quote. So if you can help us unpack the drivers of this political marketplace, how it best explains what happened in Basra in the summer of 2018, and which may be likely to repeat this year again. Please, Mac. Well, thank you, Rhonda, and thank you to the Middle East Institute. Also looking forward to hearing from Akhil and Basma and um, hopefully Bilal as well. So Rhonda's asked about this idea of the political marketplace, and, I, and this was the subject of our last report, which I think we have around here somewhere. Um, but before I get into that, let me just begin with kind of a fact that probably some of you are aware of, is that last year in 2018, during the protests, the, uh, the target of a lot of the demonstrations weren't just the government buildings or the Iranian consulate, but almost each and every political party office, um, the protesters moved from uh, Badr to Hekma to Fadilla and then Asaib al Haq, and they burned them down despite uh, great uh, <coughs> opposition due to the fact that they're, they're all sort of heavily armed. And uh, the protesters that we've interviewed in, in Basra have insisted that Sarai Salam's uh, headquarters, the Sadrus headquarters, would have also been burnt down. 
had it been not for some very peculiar circumstances and the fact that they performed uh, ataba around the uh, uh, sort of a religious thing uh, around the um, uh, headquarters, which sort of put the protesters in an awkward position. And so, you know, and, and if you look at the rhetoric of the protesters, it's not limited policy objectives that they have, it is overturning the entire governance system. And so we have to ask ourselves, so what is this governance system that the protesters are um, uh, sort of advocating against? What is this desire to entirely wipe the slate clean as opposed to you know, having a more traditional issue-based campaign? And so this is what brings us to the notion of the political marketplace. Um, in Basra, you have the same dynamic of competitive state capture uh, that you see throughout Iraq, uh, where political actors are absorbing and co-opting different organs of the state uh, for their own purposes and uh, you know, owning different assets for their own patronage networks. But in Basra, this competitive struggle is somewhat unique uh, in that it is accelerated and intensified uh, by the presence of just such a high concentration of strategic assets in one place. <clears throat> and so in Basra, uh, whether it is Hekma, Dawa, you know, state of law Dawa, uh, Sadr, Fadilla, or uh, more recently Badr and Asayeb, uh, they're all operating on a relatively uh, horizontal playing field. And they're all equally vying for, for control over Basra's strategic assets. So they stake out control over the various governmental bodies, uh, the security and service contracts around oil fields, uh, border crossings, ports, gas fields, and then any number of other government contracts. Uh, and uh, so for instance, just to give a few examples, Hekma owns companies around the northern Romela oil fields, Badr and Asayeb uh, own companies in the western Korna oil fields. Uh, Hekma controls the BOC right now. Um, and so there's, there's just this, this constantly shifting, and, I, and I, would, I would emphasize that it is shifting field of assets. So for instance, the BOC, which used to be the SOC, BOC Basra Oil Company, used to be Southern Oil Company, uh, originally between 2003 and 2008 was controlled by uh, Fadilla. Uh, that was the very violent period where there's a lot of kidnappings and killings and oil production was, was down. And then Maliki asserted himself in, in Basra. Uh, and so between 2009 and 2015, it was Dawa party that, that had control over the BOC. Now it is Hekma. Uh, and, and so it, it just constantly sort of shifts and these assets are always up for grabs. So what's the point of kind of laying out this very fragmented uh, field of political actors vying for resources? Uh, it creates two dynamics uh, in our view that have spurred the protests. One would just be government dysfunction at every level. Uh, so, you know, and what we mean by that is not just everyday bureaucracy, but also the ability to institute complex projects. So any infrastructure project of any kind, uh, you know, in any context, but uh, certainly Iraq, uh, requires reliable flow of supplies through ports, it requires visas, it requires approvals of numerous kinds, it requires land permits. The state is captured by so many different actors who can at any point inject themselves into this implementation chain and stop the entire project, that no project ever really gets completed, at least not in, the, you know, in a coherent way and on time uh, and effectively. The other dynamic, so one is government fun dysfunction. Uh, the other would just be that there is a, a closed network of jobs and opportunities. So <clears throat> within this kind of uh, field of actors, of, of political players, uh, which I would add to that also tribal actors, uh, there is a certain amount of jobs and a certain amount of opportunities that be, can be gleaned through the, uh, you know, subcontractors that are owned by the militias or the political parties or the security firms, and those are tightly controlled. And so those who are outside of that sort of system of, of party-controlled networks feel that they have no employment opportunities. So to, to close that point, I'll say that you know, when you talk to protesters, they're not interested in hearing about the youth bulge, they're not interested in hearing about the fact that oil prices have gone down. Uh, they don't really believe that these macro structural or macro economic uh, drivers are the problem. They believe that it's the party run system, the party run control over these employment networks, uh, as well as uh, the, the party run uh, kind of deterioration of uh, the entire governance uh, structure. So we'll get into more details, but I, I think that is the overall picture. 
Thanks, Mac. Uh, Akhil. <coughs> So the protest movement that we saw in, 19, in 2018 in Basra is not something new for Iraq. There have been protest movements in 2011, February 2011, protest movement in mid-July 2015, uh, and they are all calling for, you know, you know, fight against corruption, uh, improving delivery, access to government services. So what's the current status of this protest movement and how much does the structural weakness of the government led by Dr. Adel Abdel Mahdi, um, how much of an obstacle it presents for serious reforms? Yeah. Thank you for uh, putting this together. Uh, the, uh, before talking about protest, I think it's important to mention quickly a narrative about protests in Iraq post 2003 and the important turning point in 2018 about the whole idea of protest. Prior to 2018, the protests in Basra, the government, or basically more or less the ruling Shia elite, didn't take seriously protests, didn't take protesters seriously. They were usually people on the margin, 2011, for example, the seculars, the communists, and then 2012, uh, which was called the Sunni protest. It was easy for the government to demonize both uh, kinds of protests. These are misguided communists infiltrated by Qaeda and even the Merjaya, the clerical establishment, bought into this rhetoric and promoted some of it. And the, the important, really large scale protest in, uh, in Western Iraq and Northwestern Iraq also you know, went unnoticed more or less among the Shia mainstream. This was some sort of Sunni, Qaeda, you know, uh, uh, sort of conspiracy. And then the way the protests turned at the end, these were protests that lasted for uh, a year. Uh, it's really the second part of the year, March 2013, March or uh, you know, April 2013, the protests started to take more of a radical tone when you know, some extremists infiltrated them, but we had five months of really peaceful protests. But anyhow, it went down and the official register of the ruling elite, some sort of Saudi-supported Sunni conspiracy against the rule of the Shias, more or less, okay? 2018 was very important. It is the first time that protest, although in Basra was violent and targeted state property, for the first time, the idea of protest gains wide support among Shias to the point of defending targeting state institutions. Uh, you know, the peaceful protests of 2012, 2000, uh, 15. Uh, 2015, 2013, 2011, okay, even the peaceful quality of these protests generally didn't save them from being labeled as antagonistic, enemy of the state, sectarian, misguided, so on and so forth. But the 2018 protest in Basra actually sent the shock wave throughout the political class in Iraq, particularly the ruling Shia class. This was their power base. Uh, there is a limit to using power against them. The protests themselves, were extremely popular. Even media people, even analysts, even former politicians who were part of the regime, part of the system, came out in public in support of the protests. So this was a turning point in terms of you need really to take public opinion seriously. And public opinion here means Shia public opinion, very clearly. Now, this brings me to the current moment. Uh, why Adel Abdel Mahdi was chosen? Adel Abdel Mahdi was chosen by Sadr. He didn't have really much of a chance. He was chosen based on a promise that he would tackle uh, corruption. What Haider uh, uh, Abadi failed at, prepared you know, dossiers, files, to basically go after some of the high level corrupted people, failed to deliver on this. That was almost his end politically, and then his mis 
the way he mishandled the Basra protests. So Adil Abdul Mahdi comes based on a promise. He asked for one year. This is information actually confidential. I don't know if it is confidential by now. There's nothing much. YouTube. Con yes. Yes. No longer uh, confidential. So I mean, the people who were part of the negotiations said this. Uh, he asked for one year, and he even, he even said the one year is enough. Is more than enough to tackle or do something about corruption, and he used the odd example of a woman's pregnancy. You know, a woman is pregnant, the pregnancy would show in three months, so he would show results in three months, and we know what happened with that. Now, uh, the protest movement, and here we're talking about a movement that is in large part uh, spearheaded by the Sudras, but also there is another movement that's popular movement, not politically organized, tried, tries not to be associated with the Sudras, but in the end, I think the two sides will work together. So the clock is ticking, uh, Adel Abdel Mehdi hasn't delivered, and the plan, at least of those who are part of the protest movement, is that they will begin with a small scale, protests, escalate, I think what, the seventh month, the eighth month of uh, Adel Abdel Mehdi premiership, and they will escalate until probably by the end of the year that he has gotten, there will be some sort of uh, uh, larger scale protest nationwide or you know south, something of the sort. And here comes in Basra. So the protest, the narrative itself, those who are investing in protest now, and we're talking about a large Iraqi public, not necessarily those who are willing to participate, but these uh, those who are willing to support, and, and we're talking here really a large percentage of the population, is that the, the, the assumption is that this builds up on the anger of Basra 2018. And part of this, of course, is, is waiting for the spark. Supposedly the spark will be electricity. Lots of discussion about electricity, whether what the Minister of Electricity has announced is actually truthful. They said they will increase the production by 15%. You talk to Iraqi officials and they say, oh, yeah, I mean, they're worried about this, but they try to give an air of confidence. So where, where we are, this my conviction, and this is, I think, the conviction of those who are in the protest movement, these are independent convictions, but they converge, is that no reform is possible in Iraq if you leave things to the current political class. It, it, it does not have the capacity to reform itself. It's structurally involved in corruption. It's structurally unable to correct itself, to reform itself. Uh, the only way to reform things is overwhelming external pressure or internal pressure. The overwhelming external pressure is not there. The United States is not willing to do this. Neither is Iran interested in reforming these things. So it's the internal pressure. I think the positive thing about this is what I call Iraqi you know, dynamics. You know, Iraqi dynamics is going into play. And people who were not active 10 years ago, people who used to take easy sectarian positions, uh, you know, interpret everything that happens in Iraq based on a group identity. These people, these same people have moved away from that position. Uh, Mosul and what happened in Mosul 2014 was important. So uh, where we are, uh, I think increasingly we will see the rise of people's voice and actions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aqil. Uh, Basma, uh, the report again published by IRIS, uh, focus, a big part of it focused on the water project, the water crisis in Basra. And so, uh, and that has been also along with electricity, one of the major demands in <clears throat> the Basra protest, which is, has to do with the rehabilitation of water network, better delivery, uh, pol uh, dealing with pollution, salination of water. So. As we are facing again another summer, maybe electricity could be the spark, water could be the spark. So help us contextualize the water crisis in Basra. What are the causes, the consequences of people's lives and <clears throat> local economy? Please. Thank you, Randa, and thanks for having me here at MEI. Um, so there are about five different factors that are contributing to the water crisis in Basra right now. To start off, um, this is really a regional issue. It, 
is dealing with the neighboring countries, Turkey, Syria, and Iran, that are creating dams that are really constraining and constricting the amount of water that's going in and flowing into Iraq right now. Iraq is dependent on um, its neighbors for about 70% of its water supply. And in the recent years, that water supply has been reduced by almost a half. Um, so 50% less water is flowing into Iraq. So this water shortage is, is really um, driven by this regional issue, but then you have this climate change and drought that's exacerbating the problem um, and decreasing the water flow in, throughout the country as well. And if you look at the Tigris and the Euphrates River, um, you start in the north of Iraq where the, fo the water is very pure coming off the springs from the mountains. You can basically drink it right, off, uh, right from the rivers. But then as it flows up down from the, the mountains, that's when the contamination begins. And you're starting to see all the neighboring cities where these two rivers cross are essentially dumping their waste, whether it's raw waste or chemical waste, into the rivers. And that's where all of this trash basically lands in Shat al-Arab, in Basra, where the two rivers meet. And what you're seeing is Basrawis or, you know, because of w poor waste management um, systems, people in Basra are adding to the contamination by also dumping their raw waste in there as well. So the water, according to Vox News, um, so, or actually, sorry, ap according to the official Iraqi government statistics, they put the chemical contamination of Basra's water at 100% and the bacterial pollution at around 50%. So this isn't water that you can bathe in. This isn't water that you can wash clothes in, fruits or vegetables. Essentially, any drop of water that comes out of a tap is not fit for any kind of use um, for humans and animals. And what we're seeing is that this contamination is really, it's caused by, you know, just pe this, the poor waste management that we're seeing um, the government not really prioritizing. Um, but then it's also an issue coupled with the, with the climate change where you're also seeing canals in Basra being really choked off by the trash. So the water's not even being able to like, the water's not even being flushed out. Um, so you're not even getting rid of the, the swamps of trash that is just basically hovering. And as you can imagine, with the population increase, and if this issue is not addressed properly, then this problem is only going to be exacerbated and worsen in the, f in the future. This is really leading to, I think, around you know, two or three humanitarian consequences that us at the Norwegian Refugee Council are really paying very close attention to and trying as much as possible to alleviate. So the first issue that we're seeing is this loss of livelihoods, loss of jobs for people in the, in the rural areas around Basra. So according to the UN, Iraq loses 250 square kilometers of fertile land each year to, to desertification. And agriculture provides about 70% of jobs in rural Basra. So think of this massive population size, um, this massive population that is no longer going to have access to any job opportunities. Um, and that's causing um, a lot of lands to shrink because of the contamination. A lot of land is no longer um, fit for use for agriculture because of the contamination. A lot of crops are dying out. A lot of the livestock um, is dying out because of the contamination as well. Fishermen can no longer be fishermen, so they're reverting um, or trying to become farmers now, which is causing tension because of the shrinking land. You have farmer, far, like farmer to farmer tension, which is leading to armed um, violence. You also have tension between farmers and shepherds, where their livestock, which is traditionally water buffaloes, um, I urge you all to look up the marshes in Iraq. It's a stunning site. It's a UNESCO um, site, uh, but it's shrinking because of the contamination, because of the drought. So you're seeing tensions arising between the different um, farmers and shepherds there where the water buffalo is really encroaching on the agriculture land and eating the farmer's crops. And you're seeing a lot of farmers really going from being producers to consumers. 
So that's just adding to the tension that colleagues on the panel spoke about as well. The other issue that we're seeing is this rise in displacement. Um, I think as of last year, there was about 3,780 3, individuals that were displaced from Basra. The numbers, given the large-scale displacement across Iraq, is not that great, but from Basra, I mean, it's pretty significant. You're talking about 630 families last year alone. Um, in, I think it was in August alone, actually, August 2018 alone, three, uh, 630 families were displaced. So this number, I, I believe, would probably be seeing um, similar, if not more, displacement if this situation um, continues. So the displacement you're talking about um, a lot of movement from the urban uh, from the rural areas to the urban areas and it's gonna, it consists of a lot of youth and these youth have you know been brought up in more agriculture um, backgrounds these you know these are the skills that they have this is what they know and are now moving to urban settings where they're no longer equipped with the necessary skills to be employable and to join the formal workforce in Basra city and other um, urban areas. So you're having, you're seeing a lot of people that are just frustrated, um, which leads to a lot of, you know, what we talked about in the political situation. Um, but then you're also, if you take it a step below from the youth to the, the breakdown of like school infrastructures, there's a lot of children outside of school um, and just the congestion and the overall breakdown in the water infrastructure systems across Basra is also leading to large scale um, unprecedented waterborne diseases. And this spread of diseases is causing a lot of illnesses and I'll stop there, um, but happy to talk more about it in the question and answer. <coughs> Thank you, Basma. Uh, Bilal. Uh, again, building on what uh, your uh, three co-panelists have said, let's push a little bit the issue on governance. Uh, sources of political legitimacy are changing in Iraq based on what we have heard from everybody, with governance becoming a more prominent source of legitimacy. So what are the consequences of this change for the social contract between government and citizens? And what implication this will have on the capacity of the system to deliver on services that citizens are requiring and demanding. Please. Thank you for having me, and sorry I was late. Um, this is, I think, an important question, and uh, perhaps a larger point that, um, you know, is the conclusion of what my uh, co-panelists have, uh, have already discussed. Um, the general framing is that the Iraqi political landscape is shifting, and uh, patronage networks and patronage wielding that has been the main source of political legitimacy and power wielding in Iraq uh, is proving insufficient. So let me uh, parse that a little bit. Since 2003, the source of political legitimacy uh, in Iraq proper, minus Kurdistan that is, has been sectarian identity, right? The Shia, the Sunni, and then to an extent, you know, the Kurds. Uh, it's been about protection, it's been about belonging, it's been about, you know, vote for me against them, uh, you know, me versus them uh, dynamic. That dynamic uh, evolved into patronage politics, into patronage wielding, in which belonging to a sect or a political party within a sect at least translated into access to cash, access to some perks, to jobs uh, mainly, and jobs translated into you as an Iraqi citizen having a, a channel to you know, this oil-rich government coffers that uh, you know, alone is the economy. I mean, for a while, the Iraqi government was 80 to 90% of the GDP. Now it's about half of the GDP, but still, um, uh, the Iraqi government is the largest employer in the country. The Iraqi government is the largest source of cash flow in the country. Again, the, all of the trappings of a, of, a, of a petroleum state or of a petro state. And this kind of worked for a while because, uh, you know, it guaranteed jobs in return for votes. 
it guaranteed, uh, and then with the, the fact that you know there are Shia parties and Sunni parties and Kurdish parties, then in a way everyone had an had an in on this game, right? If if you're a um, a Sunni young man living in Mosul, chances are there's a Sunni political party in Mosul that you know is willing to sell you a job for you know your continued votes. And this you know dynamic applies to Basra, this dynamic applies to Baghdad, and definitely uh, in the Iraqi Kurdistan region. And this has been another source of legitimacy. It's not just you know, my, my identity, but also I am providing you with some economic benefits. I think what we are witnessing now uh, is a failure of this patronage system, that that is not enough. Because a patronage-based job can guarantee a salary. It may guarantee protection. But it does not deliver governance. It does not, for example, deliver clean water. Because a political party cannot deliver clean water. It cannot deliver electricity. It cannot deliver protection from ISIS. That was the main wake-up call of 2014. Everyone was happy. Uh, the price of oil wasn't that bad. The government was in good shape. Uh, there was financial stability. There was economic stability. What was missing was a government. A government that can, you know, a political party is there to provide you with a cash flow with a job, with an identity, but there is, no gov there is no army to protect you. There is no military to protect you. The same way that there is no government to provide you with electricity that you know, a political party alone cannot, cannot deliver, or a, or a patronage network alone, you know, your identity, just by, that's why the people of Basra were so angry last year. They didn't just go and protest against you know, the Americans or the Iranians or one political party. And that, no, they just said, you know, curse of, on all houses. Because they said, this system is failing us. And this is Basra. There is no ISIS problem in Basra. There is no sectarian problem in Basra, right? You don't have these problems that the, the, other, parts of Iraq, the, part, the other parts of Iraq are suffering from. It is sheer failure of a Shia-led government to their Shia citizens. And by the way, this is why all of the perks of patronage and money and big government and, and salaries and all of that flows. So to me, that is sort of the wake-up call of 2014 onward. And then we saw, we saw that as a source. And then we saw the, the, uh, you know, the example of, of last, uh, last year in Basra. And by the way, even before that, we saw mass demonstrations in Kurdistan. I mean, Kurdistan, by the uh, very um, uh, statement of, of KRG's natural resources minister, the KRG is only second to Cuba in terms of the percentage of the population that has a government job, which means that everyone, like 70% by some statistics, of, uh, of employment in the KRG uh, is government-based. I mean, there are some offices that literally, I mean, officials who've, who've told me that they have more people on their staff than actual physical chairs in the building. But, so that is good for a while, right? That can run for a while. Cash in the pocket is not a bad idea. Make but that, well, make, make more, more chairs. Actually, they've been trying to make more chairs, That's but then more. even, you know, <laughs> diminishing returns, my friend, diminishing returns. <laughs> But that doesn't deliver electricity. That doesn't deliver, as I said, protection. That doesn't translate into, into human security. And, and that shifting landscape, I think, was manifest, as I mentioned, by some examples. And then that was put to test last year in the elections. And then we had a public that either voted for populist political parties, like you know, the Sadrists, who promised that, you know, that we're going to approve them all, that was the, the, uh, the election logo, that we're going to approve this political class and replace them with more virtuous people. So some gave that you know, an opportunity. But if you notice, the participation rate was record low. So the majority of people didn't vote. They voted with their feet by staying home, by not participating, because the political system seems to reinvent itself rather than evolve into a better system, a system that can provide services, protection, and accountability to the citizenry. And to me, that's quite noticeable. And that is the shift that's happening. This is what the public demand. I'm not sure whether there is political will to meet this demand. And if there is political will, and this is the final point, whether there is capacity to meet that demand. Because it's one thing to want to do the right thing. And I believe that many in the current cabinet, for example, want to do the right thing. They're technocrats. Some of them are technocrats. Some of them have you know, worked in Western think tanks, and they have Western education. But it's not a one-man show. You need to have the 
technocratic capacity throughout the institutions. And I'm not sure that's available. And you know, you also have the other failures of, of, of governance going back to a decade of sanctions where the, the world community, the international community was globalizing, the finance sectors were, were moving forward, they were all advancing while the Iraqi government and the economic mentality of the Iraqi rulers were still stuck in the 1970s of, you know, they're out there to come take our oil, they're out there to come and get us. And, you know, the hardware is easy to get. In the Iraqi governance uh, capacity building is the software that's difficult to, uh, to upgrade. Thank you very much. Aqil, uh, you are in DC, so there is an obsession here with the PMUs. And oh. so we have to talk about the PMUs. And so when it comes to this whole fight against corruption, where, are, where is the PMU leadership stacking itself? For example, in Lebanon, Hezbollah is carrying the flag now of the anti-corruption campaign. And uh, do you see that happening with the PMU leadership? Yeah. Or are they becoming part of this political marketplace with their own interest, yeah. economic interest and otherwise? Please. Uh, it's a good question. It's uh, how uh, the PMU's people narrativize themselves is very important. You know, how they situate themselves in this larger narrative of Iraq post-2003. Uh, uh, 2014, the official birth, so to speak, of the PMUs, uh, uh, June 14th, I think the fatwa was. Uh, the PMUs, I mean, we have really several PMUs, but for the sake of ease, let's call them the loyalist PMUs, pro-Iran PMUs. These are the smaller portion but the more effective, the better organized, the better well-funded. And then other PMUs, probably the larger uh, you know, percentage, who basically fought you know, to heed the Marjaya's call, so to speak. Now, the loyalist uh, PMU is, uh, PMU is very organized. Now, the, the way they, they uh, situated themselves after 2014, you know, they put so much stake in the fact they were protecting the country and the way they uh, played the final victory uh, uh, against ISIS as the victory guaranteed by the PMUs. You know, the Iraqi army disappears, the Peshmerga disappears, uh, the, uh, uh, of course the Americans disappear, our Iranian friends helping us, you know, uh, that appears in the text. And if you push them, sometimes they would, men they have passing mention of the Iraqi armed forces, uh, you know, the army, and sometimes the Peshmerga. But generally, the rhetoric is that they protected the country. They guaranteed the safety of the country. Henceforth, everybody has to be beholden to them. Now, ISIS was over. That rhetoric you couldn't get much traction from. 2018, when the protests occurred in Basra, spread to Najaf, if the shock wave went through the PMUs because they were targeted. Now, one important moment for me in understanding how they react to this and how the, they reframe the narrative is that when they were at, their offices were attacked in Najaf and, and Basra, uh, Qais al Khazali came out in public and it was fascinating the way he presented it. Uh, and he basically, I mean, in his attempt to say this was a misguided act uh, by some ulterior motives and people who don't like us. Probably the hint was at the Sudras. He said, this is exactly his sentence, why are we attacked? We don't, we don't even have a minister in the government. We're basically the new kid on the block. Okay, we're fresh, we're a clean slate, we defended the country, you cannot accuse us of corruption. You can accuse the other Shias of corruption. So there's the old guard, and so to speak, the new guard, you know, the young Turks. So they are the young Turks, more or less. That's the way they try to frame themselves. Now, when they participated in the election, and they won you know, you know, the block that they are in, they're also trying to situate themselves as the clean people who are, who are really serious about going after corruption. This was the rhetoric while the government was formed before the election. That rhetoric started to disappear little by little. Why? Because it was their bloc that insisted on the old formula. 
what was the old formula? Uh, you know, ethno-sectarian power sharing, you know, each party gets a number of ministries, so on and so forth, which was what most Iraqis were against. Even those who believed in the system, the politicians who benefited from it, what's called muhasasa. I mean, no Iraqi politician now defends muhasasa. Even though they like it, they want it to continue, but you, you, cannot, you cannot pay it any, any lip service. So they lost a lot in the practice of governance. And now while they are part of the government, they have like this double rhetoric, you know, the inside rhetoric, they're part of the government, but at the same time, they're outside go the government, just like what the Sudras did, 2004, mm. all the way, probably until now. Mm. The Sudras probably are trying to harmonize their rhetoric, but you know, they have one leg outside the government and the other Inside. in the yeah. government. And they, they it, uh, in, in the end, they really lost. I think one of their biggest losses is, is the, you know, the hollow, the, the, the respect they commanded among the Shia mainstream really dissipated so fast after 2018. And particularly in the context of the Iran-US confrontation, the PMU didn't play by the government playbook. Uh, you know, they talked about one blood with the Iranians, so on and so forth. So they lost more people. They couldn't deliver in the ministries they had. So the, the further time goes, they're more of an obstacle. Now the issue is raised, I mean, this is common now in Iraq, uh, you know, uh, the government monopoly of arms, the government monopoly of, of force, even Marjia says it. And that is a jab at the PMUs, the, the loyalist PMUs, basically give up your arms. So the way they're seen, they're one obstacle to reform, although they try to play themselves as the reformers, untested and tried, basically untainted by corruption. They don't have a record of governance. That's the way they're playing it, but I think the events are not going in the direction they like, and the Iraqi questions now revolve around their own legitimacy. Uh, I don't think time is on their side. If it's okay with my fellow panelists, I'm going to take questions from the audience and then because we agreed that they will do another round of questions just among us and I have some questions which I prepared but I'm going to stop here and take questions from the audience because we are at the 30 minutes mark and then make sure that some of these questions are going to be addressed in your answers. So there will be microphones around and let's start here. Please please first introduce yourself, name, and institutional affiliation. Please. Okay, uh, Namo Abdullah, I'm the Washington correspondent for Rudaw Media Network from Kurdistan. Uh, so I have just one question for like uh, any of the panelists. Uh, what are your takes on the internal KDPP-UK dispute? Uh, is it possible for this to go out of control? Uh, the two parties have uh, called uh, uh, have put an end to the so-called media war uh, that was going on between their loyalists. And uh, 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 what, what do you think of uh, President Salas? Uh, he was invited uh, to go to Kurdistan by Nishir van Barzani. Do you think that's going to happen? And how would that change that, uh, you know, the, the situation? Thanks. Okay. I'm going to take a second question. And please, yes, sir. Who's going to take this? You want to take the first? Bilal. Okay. Yes, sir. I'm David Mack from the Middle East Institute. And uh, I, my question is about Iraq's dependence on large energy imports from Iran. Particularly, and yes. something that's very pointed as we get into this summer, mm. electricity. Um, now, whom do the Iraqi people at the street level blame for the failures of this government, particularly given its huge energy resources, I think, and around Basra, maybe the fourth largest energy oil and gas deposits in the world. Who do they blame for the failure to provide sufficient electricity? Okay, thank you. Bilal, is it okay for you to address the first question? Sure. And I'll read the second question, please. Sure. 
um, actually recently wrote about the uh, internal KRG dynamics. Um, my worry, and this is always a, a constant worry because KRG has a history of being two fiefdoms, uh, a KDP land and a PUK land where two political parties have their own uh, Peshmerga forces, military forces, and they all have their own you know, financial resources and their probably separate international relations. And then KRG is basically when these two parties decide to you know, work together and coordinate and cooperate. And when they do, you have a KRG. When they don't, you just have two fiefdoms, two zones of, 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 of influence. And uh, that's that always the fear, and that's one reason why KRG institutions have not developed. Uh, that's why KRG's uh, you know, uh, bid for statehood was not taken very seriously, because you need to act like a state before you ask other people to recognize you as a state. Hence, the referendum didn't receive you know, adequate international support. And um, one of some of the setbacks that the KRG has faced since the referendum, having gained territory, the disputed territory, and then losing them all in a very embarrassing way to the Iraqi military and Iraqi government, was also driven in part by uh, internal divisions and dynamics. And yet, today, the two political parties, instead of learning from, oh, division is actually bad for us, they're actually deepening their divisions, because at the, at the end of the day, I think international engagement has, has weakened, and they're going back to their primal needs, uh, to the survival mode. And uh, today, the KRG is not in a good position in the sense of unity acting as a government. Uh, the KDP and the PUK are striking bilateral deals with elements in the Iraqi government, which is in itself also uh, internally divided. Uh, we saw, for example, in Mosul how uh, you know, the KDP had a deal with the PMUs in electing a, a Mosul governor, rather than, for example, a deal in the, in the, in the Iraqi government. So, the challenge here is can the KRG still act in unison? Uh, I think it's in danger. It has always been in danger. But I think ultimately they realize, both the KDP and the PUK realize that, you know, the oil industry, the relation with Baghdad, the international standing, whatever reputation the KRG still has, uh, and I think it is recovering, depends on their unity. That's one. And two, um, the need for a third way, rather than just the KDP and the PUK, the third for a need way, uh, sort of, uh, a, a third way, because the dynamic, the power balance between KDP and PUK has shifted. And the KDP is trying to impose the fact that it has twice as many seats uh, than the PUK on the PUK, uh, impose a new status quo. And the PUK wants to retain the status quo ante by saying votes don't matter. It's the force and the number of Peshmerga forces that matter. Thank you. Okay. Uh, the electricity question. The technical answer is the following. The Minister of Electricity, Dr. Loy al Khatib, probably has the best of intentions. Uh, the man is trying his hardest to do something in a very difficult uh, situation, uh, but he's up against overwhelming odds. I uh, doubt that he will succeed. Uh, he has announced that there will be increase in uh, the electricity supply by 15%. Let's see if this pans out or not. Uh, this is one thing. The, the, the second thing, I mean, he has been recommended by Siron, the Sudrist, and the Communist Alliance, uh, the two. Uh, uh, my colleague, Mac, said something important. People tend to blame the party system. If things don't go well during the summer in Basra, and I don't think they will go well, but we never know. It's a weather issue, lots of variables. If things don't go well and electri the electricity supply is not there in a reliable way, uh, uh, probably the Minister of Electricity will have a difficult fight to keep his position. If he wants to keep it, they will need a scapegoat. But the public, uh, at large blames the party system. I mean, there is lots of demonization of parties in Iraq. Not that, that parties didn't do horrible things. They have done horrible things. The, the system itself is built in such a way to benefit parties, to receive protection from a party in order to basically keep your position safe uh, in case you get in uh, corruption deals, you have protection, so on and so forth. So the any failure in the services will translate, will add to this growing anger at the parties, at the party system itself, targeting all parties. Nobody will remember probably the Sudrist 
uh, have recommended the, you know, the guy, they will go after all parties, more or less. So it's, it's, it's the entire political class that will be blamed, no, no distinction really. Mac, could you like to add and best yeah. Just one quick point is that, um, you know, in our interviews with a wide range of protesters um, on sort of the causes of the protests, very consistently, and this surprised us, uh, they said that the, the kind of rallying cry of the 2015 protests was indeed electricity. But then the rhetoric shifted both, uh, you know, in a sort of two-pronged way. In 2018, it was against the party system, but then it was also uh, a matter of uh, unemployment that was the key driver. And so many, many protesters that we talked to, particularly the, the leaders, said that the kind of international media's depiction of the 2018 protests was rooted in a 2015 model. Not to say that electricity is not still a major issue, and I think as Akhil is saying, it will uh, dramatically impact the way in which this summer protests unfold or do not unfold. Um, but we also can't imagine that if somehow uh, Louis comes up with some, uh, you know, amazing solution uh, and, and makes progress in this area uh, that the other issues will uh, also be dealt with. And so I, I think there's a, uh, a tendency to kind of put everything, particularly as it's summer and we, assume, we associate summer with being hot, uh, and of course it is in Iraq, uh, that this is going to be the key issue, but I would just caution against it, focusing too much on electricity. Thank you. Questions, please. Liz? Uh, thank you. This is a question to any of you. Um, the previous uh, year's protests in Basra were um, violently repressed to some extent with arrests and assassinations and uh, some activists have had to flee the city uh, and even the country. Um, do you expect that this kind of use of violence uh, towards the end in particular uh, would deter protests in the coming uh, months, in the coming summer? Uh, and if protests do erupt, do you expect, again, this use of kind of a heavy-handed approach of assassinating, killing off, intimidating uh, activists? Thank you. Uh, and yeah, and I'm Elizabeth uh, from the Education for Peace in Iraq Center. Okay, please, behind you. Yes. Hi, uh, my name is Shukriya. I'm a PhD student on international security and foreign policy. My question is about GCC. Uh, we know that Saudi Arabia and most of the GCC, they pay attention to Iraq after the Arab Prize in 2012. So as I call it the super, uh, soft power of Saudi Arabia in Iraq after uh, Trump's new policy in Iraq and against Iran. So my question is uh, how you can see these policies working in Basra after we know that Saudi Arabia provided Basra's electricity after what happened between Iran and Basra's government. So how Saudi Arabia can play the best role in Iraq in the uh, construction of this country? Thank you. Would you like to answer this, add something to Not this? The GCC. No. Yeah, no. okay, who would like to take the first question? Uh, the first question, which is Liz's question about detention, violence, oh, okay. whether this is going to repeat, okay. the heavy handedness. Uh, yes, the, I mean, this is, uh, this is a difficult question for them, how far they can go in targeting their own power base. I think there's even a debate among themselves about that. What I heard- Themselves. Themselves, the political class. Okay, with the <laughs> okay. PMUs. Uh, with the PMUs, uh, the PMUs are more ready, the loyalist PMUs are more ready to actually take on the protesters in the name of, you know, these are some uh, infiltrators, so on and so forth. You know, I mean, th there is a rhetoric uh, you know, ready for that. What I heard uh, a theory from somebody who's a close to the protest movement, close to the government, and it makes sense to me. Uh, is that uh, if when when this happens, if there if there are large scale protests targeting of state institutions, and it's difficult for me to imagine protests in Basra or in the South without targeting state institutions or you know party institutions, so to speak, they're part of the state anyhow. Uh, 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 there there is the willingness to respond uh, uh, in kind to them using violence. Uh, the theory is uh, you will ask the army, you will ask even the PMUs to use violence against the protesters, but that would be the moment of parting ways. Mm. Uh, the majority of the army, the majority of the PMUs will side with the people, and then we will have a different kind of game. Uh, that is one of the scenarios. Uh, 
that is being circulated. To me, it is realistic if they go too far in targeting uh, the protesters, and it, but it, it, it's a very, very difficult question. You cannot really justify it uh, uh, in front of the Iraqi public, you know, targeting the protesters. So we interviewed uh, protesters on this specific point, and they emphasized that uh, right now, uh, any attempt for protesters to kind of come together and organize into sort of a coherent political movement that has a coherent ideology and structure and plan is immediately disrupted by detentions, uh, kidnappings, killings. Um, and so, you know, we, we weren't, uh, able to sort of independently verify this, but we heard it across so many different actors and protesters that we, we feel that there's uh, something to that. And so for a lot of the protesters, they felt that uh, as we looked at this summer, there was at least a chance that this sort of level of repression would keep the protests disorganized and fragmented and that they wouldn't necessarily coalesce into this mass kind of movement. One other point on that is that uh, protesters have a narrative uh, about the political parties that on the one hand emphasizes um, this kind of dynamic of competition that we've discussed, but also a dynamic of collusion. Mm -hmm. um, so they, they will say that uh, you know, the uh, political parties and militias have strategically placed their headquarters uh, across the city in such a way that they can kind of collude in surveilling the, pu the public. Uh, and they will say that this is the same uh, tactic that the, the Ba'athists used. And so the, there is a, a way in which the perception on the, the protesters' side is that the, the po political establishment, despite all this competition, is also uh, working together to, uh, to, to stamp down any uh, potential major demonstration. So, Bilal, would you like to uh, address a, a few, um, a few question. comments? Um, the second question. Sure. I mean, to tie this uh, question back into my earlier points about how what we're witnessing in Iraq is a failure of the, of the uh, you know, patronage politics. One of the failures of patronage politics is the absence of a return address, uh, the absence of accountability. When something goes wrong, you don't know who to blame. And then when you don't know who to blame, therefore you blame everyone and everything and, and the whole political process, the whole political class. And that's also one of the mismatches between what the public wants and what the, uh, uh, what the government can, um, uh, can deliver. Uh, the, the question of, um, of uh, Gulf relations, I think uh, there has been at least one positive change in the Saudi attitude toward Iraq, and that is dealing with the Iraqi government rather than dealing with elements in the Iraqi government. I mean, in the past, there was like even humorous that, you know, they say that like, if politicians needed money, they would just go to Riyadh, hang out for a couple of days, come back with a briefcase of money. Uh, you know, they did not know how to decipher Iraq. So, you know, people exploited their, their ignorance of Iraq or their even like hands-off approach toward Iraq because there was an attitude. Uh, a, there was basically ignorance of Iraq, you know, 10 years of sanctions plus. Uh, and then the attitude that Iraq is lost to Iran. That has changed. There's a realization that there is more to Iraq than, than you know, bears the eye. I mean, Iraqi nationalism is emerging. Uh, I mean, there is a sense of, if, if you look at uh, some polling that um, uh, you know, Mr. Dr. Dagher does, you can clearly sense that is a sense of Iraq first. Uh, in this clash between you know, the United States and Iran, that Iraq first attitude is very clear. You could hear it very clearly, a call for Iraq's sovereignty and preserving Iraq's interest in the speech, for example, that Iraq's president, uh, Barham Saleh, uh, made in, uh, in Riyadh, in, sorry, in Mecca, in the summits, right? Let us be, let, let us define what is good for us. Let us define our interests. Don't define it for us, and then don't decide how we should define it. Basically, don't paint us, you know, in, in your image, and, and don't impose your own calculations on us. Uh, so that attitude is, is emerging, and it's a question of the political class and how much responsive they can be. So the Saudis, at least, have done one positive thing, that they, they realize this, and they deal with the Iraqi government, with the official channels, rather than political parties and, and elements. But I think the real danger for what's going on in Basra is not on Saudi Arabia, it's on Kuwait. Uh, because, you know, even like familially and geographically, the, the danger of a spillover effect of unrest in Basra is going to be felt in Kuwait. And actually, of the GCC countries, Kuwait has been the most responsive in extending Correct. help to the Iraqi government. Thank you. Basma, 
Before I give the floor, I, I'm going to ask you a question, which I think, again, we have to come back to the water crisis is, okay, the international organizations have, you know, been involved in, with the service uh, portfolio. And so with respect to the water crisis, if you can, you know, give us some uh, indication of what has been done, what are the plans going forward, especially from the case of the organization that you are representing here. What are the plans to help with dealing with the water crisis? Please. Sure, um, thanks, Renda, for that question. So I wanna preface what I'm gonna say by claiming that, and it kind of contributes to what colleagues were also highlighting on the politicization of everything in Basra, is that even humanitarian assistance in Basra has been quite politicized. Um, a lot of our traditional donors have been more reluctant to fund humanitarian assistance in Basra because, I mean, understandably, they put the burden and the onus on the government of Iraq and claim that you know it's the Iraqi government's responsibility to respond, not the international donors. Understanding where they're coming from, but at the end of the day, recognizing that, as always, civilians tend to be the ones stuck in the midst of political crises. So with that, I just wanna really pay, you know, kind of hone in a little bit on the work that the Norwegian Refugee Council has been doing in regards to rehabilitating schools, in particular um, in Basra. A lot of the school infrastructure, the newest schools were built in the 1970s and have had very minimal upkeep and maintenance. A lot of these schools were designed for smaller classes, less population, and most of them tend to have one or two restrooms. Um, so with the water crisis and the shortage of water, the contamination of water, the taps, the water only comes to the schools twi for two hours a day. Um, you're talking about hundreds of students that are congested in very small spaces. It's caused a lot of unsanitary conditions where kids have experienced illnesses and have gone through um, waterborne or have had waterborne diseases that have caused them to drop out of school. So we're seeing around 277,000 children that are at risk of dropping out of school because of waterborne diseases. And these are this is really the, the biggest issue that we're focusing on. Bottled water has spiked so that now it costs, you know, about 120 to 140 dollars to to get clean water per month for an average family and the average salary is about 330 US dollars. So I mean that's a huge portion of your population of your income that you're spending on clean water. Um, so what NRC has really been focused on doing is rehabilitating the water infrastructures and the sanitation spaces in schools, like updating latrines, updating taps, um, and trying to extend piping so that clean water comes out of the tap. Um, as you can imagine, um, this is also, we've also experienced funding shortages. So now we've had to actually spot, uh, stop uh, this program because donors are having, you know, they're reluctant and not as interested or keen um, in funding these efforts. What we're also doing is trying to provide livelihood training. So the farmers that, or the new farmers or the farmers that are struggling to maintain that, um, that job or that occupation, we're teaching them um, or supporting them in learning new sustainable ways of farming where you need less water, how to clean water, how to desalinate water. And then the third thing that we're doing is really trying to provide vocational training for the youth that have migrated to the urban settings and trying to equip them with practical skills in making them more attractive or more competitive in the formal workforce, like coding, um, like training them on welding, mobile maintenance, practical skills that really integrates them into formal, um, to the formal workforce and tries you know, to give them some semblance of a future. Thank you, thank you, Vesma. Okay, let's take one question here in the front and then one question in the back, please. Thank you very, thank you very much, great panel. Alexander Kravitz from Insight. A question for um, Akil. On, back to the PMUs, could you give us an idea of what is their size currently? Meaning, you know, they, after the fight, you would think that normally, you know, since they were a fighting force, that recruitment would have, should have gone down. And, and 
pardon the innocence or the ignorance about this question, by, but what, if there was a fatwa that created them, why not a fatwa to dissolve them? I mean, that might be too simplistic. And uh, uh, to Basma, have you explored having the Iraqi government fund some of your projects? And what has that resulted in? Thank you. One here, the gentleman, yourself, please. Yes. Thank you. Thanks. I'm uh, Gabriel Young, PhD student at NYU. Uh, my question is for uh, Bess Malouche. And that is, um, one, I've, I was reading from local journalism that uh, rains returned to Basra for the first time um, substantially in a long time. And you could actually, certain kinds of wildlife returned to the marshes. Um, so did that have any noticeable effect on the kinds of uh, political ecologies that you were looking at? And second, do you think that NR, uh, NRC is implicated in the, extra in the political marketplace that uh, Mac described? <laughs> okay, Basma, and then Aqil, and then the other two panelists can contribute as well, please. So quickly on your question on the government, Ira uh, the Iraqi government funding some of the projects, I mean, that's, it, it would be something we would like to see. I mean, the role of humanitarians is to eventually get ourselves out of a job. Um, so if the government of Iraq is, is willing to take on these projects, I think this, this would be great. But what we're seeing is there hasn't been, you know, systematic efforts to really take on um, these projects. To fund. So that hasn't been, I mean, it hasn't been an off, like, a, it hasn't been a discussion. Um, but we're also seeing, you know, if our, even if they do fund some of our projects, like when we rehabilitated some of the schools, they were 11 schools. There's hundreds of schools in Basra. So this really requires a national plan, something on the, like, the national level, um, the city level, that even if they were to fund some of our programs, it's really just, you know, a drop in the ocean compared to the amount of needs. So I don't know if that, I hope that addresses your question. And on, on your question, um, on the rains, yes, Definitely, um, the, the rivers were, were filled. My colleagues were in Basra two weeks ago and they came back with pictures of rivers filled. But the problem is the contamination levels are so high. The amount of trash, I mean plastic, if you just Google any picture, they literally choke up the canals. So even if the, flood, uh, even if the rivers are really high in terms of water levels, the water is still not flowing through because it's being blocked because of the amount of garbage. And on the market um, level, so what humanitarians, the way we operate is we really try to procure locally. Um, so in terms of, you know, that, I mean, we, I think we try our best to, to abide by the do no harm principle. Um, so in, in terms of that, that's probably as much as I can say. Mac, would you like to add something before I turn over to the PMU? Um. There is a perception among some Basrawis that uh, humanitarian organizations are a part of this sort of network of actors, but it wasn't a dominant narrative, uh, probably because in any Iraqi city, the humanitarian sector uh, has a very small role in the scheme of things, uh, and so it, it doesn't usually, Mosul, you might say, is kind of an exception because the EU has been doing a lot, at least in the old city, but it, it doesn't really enter into the political narrative so much. One, one point on water, when we did interviews across different political actors, um, whether it be MPs or uh, uh, provincial council or what have you, yes, they were very happy that there had been this, this rain and were, you know, thanking uh, everyone for that. Um, but it, it, it was also kind of immediately uh, followed up with a kind of skepticism because, as Basma is saying, uh, the distribution networks within Basra are so weak. So even if you created an enormous uh, desalination facility or you had a perfect le levels of, of uh, rainwater, uh, the distribution capacity is so weak and so clogged uh, that uh, it hasn't given politicians probably the relief that they would like to have. 
Okay. Yeah, I just want to answer PMUs. your question. It has something to do with the PMUs and then get, go back okay. to your question. Uh, so, as my colleague said, Saudi Arabia has really a different kind of approach, a very positive approach to Iraq. Uh, basically, the Saudis and the Emiratis went to the Iraqi government and said, we want to deal with you. We have this much money, lots of money, I think a billion dollars, I heard only from Saudi Arabia. We want to spend it, but you spend it through you. You decide the projects, and we will only just give the money. The disagreements are Iraqi, basically. So they had like one uh, agricultural project, I think, in the middle Euphrates, the thousand hectares, and Lots of debate. We don't know what's truthful, what's not. They wanted to open a consulate in Najaf at the advice of the Iraqi government, and then others came, and then why would we have Wahhabis in Najaf, so on and so forth. Uh, some of the Iraqi politicians came out and said, this, this is not helpful. The Saudis are extending their hand to us, and some other forces are undermining this. The hint was towards PMUs. Now, the PMUs, a lots of PMUs actually demobilize, but that's not the loyalist PMUs, the, the ones uh, that are close to Iran. Uh, 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 your question is logical. Uh, there is no logical answer to it. Uh, <laughs> Uh, and there, there has been lots of debate about this. Uh, supposedly, the highest number was 120,000. Now it's much less. I am in some groups, uh, WhatsApp groups that include high-level politicians, some of them working with the PMUs. And the, and the question is always asked, and they don't give you a number. Uh, there is, they still have a problem with ghost employees. The other day, one force that supposedly existed in Samarra uh, was gathering salaries, and then the Hashid in itself came out and said, that forest does not actually exist. They were taking the money, building some malls for themselves. So, no answer to your question. Now, the other part, uh, what should, which should they do with the PMUs? In, inside Merjiya, inside the clerical establishment, there is a discussion about this. Why not issue a fatwa? You fought, you did well, thank you very much, go back home, this and will remove the legitimacy. they still call them volunteers. The they volunteers, they, yeah, them. they have never sanctioned them. Yes. Yes. But the, that, that is one thinking about it. The other thinking is, which is the more realist one, I think, from the point of view of the Merjiya, is that they want the PMUs to demobilize, but they think it's still not the right time. They don't really trust that the Iraqi army will deliver. It has not been institutionalized well enough to be reliable and you know to gain the support of the population. That is one argument, but Marjoria is certainly for further, further institutionalization of the Hajj al-Shabi, of the PMUs. And even the PMUs people, the loyalists, once they feel the heat and they're talking about further and further institutionalization, will they be institutionalized to the level that their ideological label disappears? That's the question. So uh, we're coming to the end, but before I conclude this event, I want to turn it over to Mac and ask him, so what should we expect, you know, uh, this summer going forward based on your research? Uh, Aqil has already predicted, you know, some tempo you know, an increasing sustained tempo of protest movement leading maybe to a large scale protest by the end of the year and who knows what will happen to the government of Adel Abdel Mahdi. What are your expectations? That is a hard question to, to answer. Um, I would say just two quick things. One, the core issues that drove the 2018 protests are still in place. So uh, if you take unemployment, what has been the government's response on this? The central government promised 10,000 jobs never materialize. Provincial government uh, set up an employment office that was immediately co-opted co by two political parties. Uh, and it was also perceived that that office itself was not able to force, uh, was not strong enough to force the militia and party-run subcontractors to actually hire in this through this sort of mechanism. So uh, th there is a sense that on the, the major issues, uh, the, uh, the problems have not been resolved. But I would say before we can, um, you know, in addition to what I said earlier about violence, before we can make any sort of um, forecasting about this year, we should also look at how random last year was uh, and how actually what happened didn't necessarily have to happen. Uh, in 2018, it started with the Sadrists and the communists sort of organized protests in the middle of the city. 
Uh, and these were sort of the, and slowly they, they started uh, bringing a wider following. But they themselves, uh, the core of the protest movement, were shocked that all of a sudden there was sort of masses of people around the oil fields protesting and then the security uh, forces responded in such a way that a bystander died, then it became a revenge thing, and then the sort of oil field protesters merged with the city protesters, and from, it went from being every Friday to every day. This was not something that was an organized, systemic uh, kind of event. And so I, I, I think we just have to realize that social movements in Iraq are unpredictable. Uh, it, it's going to be hard to note at what scale. Of course, there will be protests. There are protests right now. But will there be a spark that will um, ignite this kind of mass level discontent? I don't think we know. Thank you. Uh, before I conclude this event, I have a brief announcement to make. We now make announcements here at MEI at the end of every event. So on June 14, Friday, MEI is hosting a discussion with Sam Dagger about his new book, Assad or We Burn the Country. My colleague Charles Lister will be moderating the discussion with Sam, and he will be joined also by Waila Zayat and Rafif Shwajati. I have started reading uh, Sam's book. It's a fascinating read, and I think this is going to be a fascinating event, not to be missed event. If you haven't registered, please do, please do so. Please do so. So in conclusion, on behalf of MEI, I would like to, co to thank our co-sponsor, Iris, uh, the panelists, and the audience for joining us today. And we will all continue to be paying attention to Iraq, to what happens in Iraq, and wishing that finally Iraq finds its way to a sustainable peace. Thank you very much.